the economics aren't great when you're just focused on forest restoration, right? Because you're not just chasing the big timber and the, and the high value timber that's easy to make something out of. Like, um, you can easily put together a business plan to make great lumber out of number one Douglas for big trees. Right. Yep. Um, and so that was a, that was a challenge. It's like, okay, we want a mill back, but it can't be what it, what it was before. It's gotta yeah. be something different, focused on something different. And so that's what, that's what essentially we did is look at, well, what, what are the products that can be made of the timber that needs to be removed? So starting less from, well, here's the easy business model, or here's the, the type of mill that we're used to. We need to find the timber for that. Instead, looking at it and say, well, what is the timber that's going to be coming out if we're actually looking at doing proper forest restoration? These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. A hot drink can become cool in two primary ways, through conduction and convection. Conduction occurs when two objects touch each other. Imagine holding a piece of ice. Before long, your fingers are cold and the ice begins to melt. That's conduction. Convection occurs when a gas or liquid moves from being different temperatures. When you heat water over a stove, the warm water moves up and the cool water moves down. That's what you're seeing when water boils, and that's convection. A stainless vacuum bottle prevents conduction from occurring by creating a void between the walls of the bottle, thermos, or cup and the outside air. It prevents convection by keeping all the liquid inside at the same temperature. That's how a Stanley product keeps your cold drink cold and your hot drink hot. And they've been doing it for 110 years. The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Stanley 1913. And you can check out their new and classic line of products at Stanley1913.com. Where were you born? I was born in Vanderhoof, British Columbia. Where's that? Dead center of of BC, Canada. Dead center of BC. Yeah, about five miles out of town. We had the east west north south monument. Oh, really? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I didn't know there was such a thing. Why would I? Now you know. Now I know. <laughs> it's like a four corners almost. Yeah, you got to have. You come from a little town. You got to have something to talk about, right? Do you know about the controversy surrounding the geographic center of? the United States. I do not. There's a lot of argument about it, huh. about where the center of the 50 U.S. states is. And there's an article that came out in like the, I don't know, National Geographic in 1959, right after we got Alaska and Hawaii. And they said it was uh, Pondosa, Oregon, just on the other side of the Eagle Caps. Oh, yeah, because of that. That's strange, right? But it's a hard thing to put a circle on top of a sphere that isn't perfect, the imperfect sphere being the globe, and then figure out where the center of that circle is. So there's still debate about it, huh. but we are pretty close to the center of the U.S. according to somebody from National Geographic nice. yeah. <laughs> 70 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of funny. Which only makes sense with Alaska and Hawaii, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. But a, a tricky piece of math right. for sure. Uh, did you grow up there? I did, and uh, for the most part, till I was thirteen or so. Yeah, yeah. And then where did you go? Spent uh, actually spent a year, I think, when I was twelve in uh, in Anaheim Lake, which is the headwaters of the Dean River. Okay. Which, if, as a fisherman, you're probably well aware of. And it was the when the mountain pine beetle epidemic was first starting in British Columbia, which obviously has spread all across the West since then. Yeah. And uh, my family moved there. My dad was an operations manager for a mill that got uh, asked to go and set up a remote operation there to try and log as fast as they could to log all the pine beetle. Okay. Uh, and they thought at that time that that was a solution to try and get in front of it. Yeah. Did and it so, work? Uh, it didn't. Okay. Yeah. But Have we learned about anything since then that will work? Uh, not really. Cause beetle kill is yeah. continuing to be an issue. I just found some new beetle kill last week and I've been asking around about 
you know, what to do from a management standpoint. And some people are like, well, you hope for a cold winter, but I bet your winters were plenty cold. Yeah. What were winters like up there? Uh, you know, as, as you grow up, you always think they were colder and longer than they probably were just because when you're a kid, everything feels like that, yeah. but, uh, it, they were really similar to here. And in fact, even with family up there now, we often have very similar weather trends to yeah. Northeast Oregon. And okay. so, yeah. So 20 below. Yep. Definitely had those, those days. Tell me about making ice bridges. Got to do it once. Yeah. It was really interesting. Yeah. That's that's fascinating to me. I want I want to hear all about that. <laughs> it was a pretty unique winter for sure. I was uh, uh, between traveling and going to college and uh, and had an opportunity to work for the winter in uh, the Northwest Territories. Okay, and so there was a uh, there was a fire up there that was burning in the um, kind of in the muskeg or tundra, and mm-hmm. so it was burning underground, and uh, and because of the you know it was insulated basically burning in the peat moss it never actually burned timber it okay. actually just burned in the ground for several years yeah and so there was a tiny little river up there uh, called the rabbit river and it was just a winding as you see from aerial pictures just this little winding river and really big spruce timber that it was burning all the roots off and then these trees would just fall over in a like jack straw of, oh, of trees. Makes sense. Yeah, it was, you know, and it was just crazy. Their, so was, their feet had burned off, totally. so they're going to tip yeah. over. And uh, and so I guess they, you know, there was a mill up there that wanted to go, you know, salvage some of this timber so that they could, you know, replant and get get forest growing again on that, you know, whatever it's going to take hundreds of years to grow forest back in that climate. But long story short, I I was asked to go up and and work on that job, and uh, and we had to build an ice bridge across the Mackenzie river, which, you know, third biggest river in the world. And, uh, it was, so how big, I'm going to look up some Mackenzie river <laughs> stats. Real so it was, a, it was a mile across where we, where wow. we were. And we, we were based out of a little community, uh, called Jean Marie river, which, uh, was only accessible by ice road in the winter or by a plane or boat in the summer. And, uh, so we stayed in the, stayed in the, schoolhouse there while we were doing it and basically everyone in this little um first nations community you know kind of got on board with us helping us and uh and so we the first thing we did was took a tiny little you know waited till the i went with snowmobiles and drilled through the ice to see if it was thick enough and then took like a little tiny d3 cat to just push enough snow off so that we could actually drive across it okay and then for i think it was almost three weeks uh, a friend of mine and I stayed there and every day we would go out and we drilled holes every 30 feet all the way across. And we had two lanes. How did, how did you drill the holes? Uh, just with a, a gas powered auger. Okay. But so like a four inch hole. Yeah. Something? And then, yeah, probably six inch. Like, and then every day it was easy enough to keep those holes, redrill the same holes or keep them open. Yeah. And we had this, uh, little pump that stuck in the hole and it would pump water. It was like a little jet, and it would pump water and and spin itself in a circle. Okay. And so we just stick it in, fire it up, it spin in a circle, flood the ice, shut it off, grab it, and run to the next hole, and just spent the entire day for you know multiple weeks. It would take us all day to go all the way across one lane and all the way back the other, and just put one one layer of water on every day, and uh, eventually we got to like twelve feet of ice. 12 feet of yeah. ice. Yeah. Why did you need it that thick? Because we were hauling like 100,000 pound <laughs> truckloads of logs across it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It was super interesting. So, so did it turn into like, I'm, I'm picturing like this, this freeway where it's way above the rest of the ice around it. It didn't really, I think it got thicker below too. And that's what happens. I think when you drive on it with weight, it sure. starts building up on the bottom side too. Yeah. And, uh, I, I mean, it was intense. I, I had no experience with it. It's just like learning from people in the community that had built them before. They'd never built one across there before. Yeah. And it was really neat for, you know, for people there because when we drove across that river then and started working, they had seismic lines. The country's just full of old, like mining or oil exploration lines. Yeah. So there's seismic lines that we followed up and, you know, I think it was 30 kilometers to where we were working. And it was me and one dude in a 
little Atco trailer <laughs> 30 kilometers up there. And it was pretty awesome because we'd work and, uh, and just, you know, the two of us camped out. And my, my friend Nate, he actually lives in Australia now, but uh, we, we just camped out there for the winter and, and uh, just had the most spectacular winter. Just never been somewhere so quiet and dark. Yeah. And, you know, up there in the Muskeg, the wind just often, there's very little wind ever. Yeah. And it's just so still at night. And so, you know, you'd have Northern Lights episodes frequently and the kind, because of the stillness there, that you just could hear them. And it was just like mind blowing. You can hear the Northern Lights? Yeah. Shut up. Yeah. What is they? It, it sounds like static and it really? al- it almost sounds like wind. It's kind of a weird kind of crackling wind noise. And who knows if it's a mind trick just because you're watching this incredible dance going on. But um, definitely feels like you can feel it and hear it. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so incredible. Yeah, definitely a you know, once in a lifetime thing that you you will never forget. Huh. And how old were you when all this was going on? I would have been 19 probably. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Okay. So I got ahead of myself. Thirteen. Uh, were you getting involved in that logging project? Yeah, as involved as a, as a twelve or thirteen year old can. Yeah. Um, uh, I got opportunities to run equipment. My uh, where the mill was and where we lived was about twenty twenty five kilometers from where we were logging. Okay. And so uh, you know, I'd finish my schoolwork for the day, and then my dad would let me. Uh, it was too short of a distance for them to use a low bed to haul logging equipment. And so, you know, if they had a machine in the shop or something, and he'd say, okay, when you're done your school work today, you know, have your mom drive you over to the shop and drive this skitter 20 kilometers up the road for us. And, yeah. And so I, yeah, I got lots of fun opportunities like that. Yeah. And, yeah. Which feels super badass for about the first kilometer. Yeah. Right. And then you're like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it was, it was, it was, in, it was in pretty intense, like grizzly bear and wolf country too. And so you'd be like driving this like D8 dozer, like incredibly slow with no enclosed cab, just going, you know, this just came out of the shop because it was broke down. If it breaks down, we'd be out here for hours. I was like, and you're 12 years old. I don't know. Maybe some people might differ, but I definitely yeah. have those thoughts. I sunk my snowmobile last week when I was out in a place that, you know, was an hour and a half from anywhere and, uh, no cell service, like nobody's coming. And I, you know, just put it about five feet deep in the snow and, uh, thought I had it dug out, made it, you know, three feet and it sunk down again. And then, you know, it was hitting pine needles. So I was all the way down to the bottom and I started to dig out again and I stopped and looked around. And I was like, if I have to spend the night, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how is this going to go? <laughs> like, should I be using this energy to build myself a little snow shelter or right. should I get this sled out? And that's a lot of energy. Like there's nothing like a buried sled. Yes. Yeah. yeah you sweat. Yeah. 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 Um, but no, it's, it's kind of fun to have those uh, like really high consequence equipment failure thoughts yeah. every once in a while. Like <laughs> if it's just up to me, then how does this go down? Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, I okay. Had a, I had a similar one where I had a, uh, a couple of years after the ice bridge, I had a excavating job where I was doing some uh, tree planting, uh, uh, silviculture work prepping for tree planting. And so was out in a, uh, in a muskeg area where we had to fly fuel into caches for our machine. And I had a cross shift that was uh, working on it, on the excavator with me. And, I, and so we were working 12 hours each and we'd have to either take snowmobile or four wheeler into where we were working. And so uh, I, I went in one night and switched off with him and I had to get some parts or something. So I was a little late. So I met him on the trail. We usually met at the machine so we could say, Oh, we did this work and this is what you need to do. Um, and, and I met him, on the trail and asked him to take, go back with me to show me. And it was just like a five minute ride. So he stopped and put his lunch pail and thermos down in the middle of the trail and turned around, came back with me, showed me what he was doing and, uh, and left. And the next morning he never, never came back and spelled me off. And so I'm like, okay, well, 
mean, I've been here for 13, 14 hours. I'm, I'm going to go. And I went back to my truck and there was a note on my, on my seat that said, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I'm, I'm out of here. And I guess what happened is, uh, he had left me that evening and went back and, and it was 15 minutes later. And his thermos in his lunchbox was sitting in the middle of the trail and it was just surrounded by wolf tracks. Oh, really? Yeah. And, uh, he, he was having none of it. And so, yeah. uh, so definitely I, I had some thoughts the next few evenings about what was going to happen if my, if my four wheeler didn't make it out of there. Cause it was having a few issues. So, the, yeah. the, Equipment the, failure is never fun in high consequence situations. The, uh, the wolves are trying to break into the old Stanley. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe it's a good advertisement. They are a sponsor. Of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, so what was, what was education like growing up? Like, did you go to a public school? No, I went to a small private uh, Christian school growing up. Okay. So grew up in sort of a conservative community and, yeah. Really conservative, right? Yeah, really conservative. Yeah. yeah. Tell me more about that. Huh. I don't know what there's much to say, but, uh, yeah, went to a small, uh, small conservative school. Didn't really know any different. Right. Um, and, uh then I went to high school in a similar, but a less conservative in a different community. Okay. Um, that was, you know, a little bit m- more, more eye opening. I had yeah. more opportunities to, uh, to expand my horizons a little bit. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it was definitely interesting. I, you know, I, you grew up Mennonite, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's kind of what, what I was driving towards there. I think it's really interesting when, when your horizon like suddenly expands yeah. sometimes yeah. Um, and some people handle that more gracefully than others. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think you handled it very gracefully. Uh, some people retreat back into what they, what they knew and, and are comfortable with. And I'm not at all saying that yeah. know, one is more right than another. It's no. not the case, but it, it is interesting. Yeah. It can be difficult be mostly because I think, you know, people, that try to shelter themselves, um, especially when you're trying to shelter your kids or not even trying to just by the nature of the way you, right. you lead your life shelters children, you know, inevitably, or at least most of the time, there is going to be some exposure at some point. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and it's kind of like, you know, I have a five year old now and it's yeah. like, do I never let him play with anything dangerous? Because then it's going to be really bad at it if all of a sudden, you, and it's the yeah. same thing with life. It's you can be ill-equipped um, if you're not given opportunities in a measured environment to have your horizons expanded. Right? Like when when you're young, are those times that you should be bumping up against areas of comfort and being able to have parents and other people around to answer those questions and figure those things out. So when you just all of a sudden come dead stop to like something that's mind blowing or completely different experience, it can be difficult. And so it doesn't work out for, for everyone. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that's what you were driving. at. Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, I had a lot, a lot of those steps and stuff growing up here. Like, you know, I thought that this, this experience was, was the world. Right. Um, you know, I thought that that our local radio station had the entire spectrum of music. Right. So in my mind, uh, you know, Garth Brooks was a representative of like rock and roll. <laughs> um, I didn't realize that the only radio station we had was a country station, and that was just one little part of music. So as I got to to travel and see more of the world and live in different places, it throws back that horizon in ways that feels very exciting and Mm -hmm. and a little bit um, unsettling sometimes too. Uh, What led you from Canada to Belize? Oh boy. Um, Because that, that's a, that's a big shift, but also has that Mennonite tie, right? Yeah. I, I, I went to, to Belize when I was older with my, um, my brother-in-law lived there Mm because there's, there's a big, um, Mennonite community down there, and uh, and so yeah, went and, and saw some of that down there, which was really interesting. I think there's yeah. Mennonites spread all over the Americas mm-hmm. um, for a lot of the similar reasons that they came to Canada, you know, uh, many many years ago. Which was what? I, that's not a story that I know. I, I mean, I don't know it well either, but yeah. I think that you know, like many religious groups that you know, m- end up traveling around the world 
for you know escaping either religious persecution or looking for i think in mennonites oftentimes when you look at some of the central and south american communities they were they were looking for opportunities to go places where government wouldn't interfere with their lifestyle right yeah. and i think belize was a good um is a good representative of that when uh when belize became an independent country from um british honduras they were really looking for for people to be able to help with infrastructure. Mm. And so, you know, the and, and ag production as right, well, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so they essentially traded the Mennonite Mennonite communities from Canada land and also the ability to basically self govern for the option of having sort of that that ag and industry brought to the country, which was really probably pretty smart because yeah. it did it did bring a lot of those resources to the country that they might not have had otherwise. And so I think there's other countries like that. I know there's communities in Bolivia that are the same way. Mm. Um, and so I think, I think that some of the Canadian Mennonites spread across the Americas for some of those yeah. very reasons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So, so you went to Belize to visit your brother-in-law. Is that went, the deal? That, yeah. No, I went with my brother-in-law when oh, I was, with, and I was actually, I was in my probably early thirties because, uh, we uh, had an opportunity to to maybe buy some land down there, and oh. it seemed like a fun opportunity. Yeah, it probably would have been. What kind of land? Island. You're gonna buy an island? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, you know. <laughs> we, we went out with a. It was out on uh, Turnafe Toll, and we took a um, a boat out there. You know, double double prop big boat, bombed out there. You know, super fast. And spent the day, and we were going to like survey the the corner posts and stuff, and make sure that it lined up, which it actually didn't. You know, yeah. it's like we GPS, it's like it was completely off of what their maps were, and so we went to the uh, to the Ministry of Lands to go yeah. like, is this you know is this right? Is this real? And and it's such a small country. We went into the Ministry of Lands office and like, yeah, we want to talk to someone about this. We're like, oh yeah, come on to this office, and we sit down on this guy's desk, and his desk says Minister of Lands, and we're like. We're talking to the man. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, he's like, oh, yeah, no, that's just the way it is. Don't worry about it. I was like, well, it's kind of hard to not yeah. worry about it. But, Need to know what uh, we're buying and where it yeah, is. Yeah, but, uh, but probably worse than that was when we went to try and hit those corner posts and uh, trudged off for a couple hundred yards through mangrove swamp to find them. And, uh, and I grew up with bad mosquitoes. Oh. That was the worst mosquitoes. I, I, really? I, for the first time ever, was like, oh, you could, you could really lose your mind. Yeah. 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 I'm about six mosquitoes away from that yeah <laughs> like if i have six active <laughs> mosquitoes hunting me i'm i'm losing it what an awful animal um did you read about japan just finding a bunch of islands they just found seven thousand new islands that they were previously unaware of per their last survey is this because the ocean water levels are no they're rising we shouldn't be finding more islands right <laughs> I don't know, dude. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's backwards, man. But uh, yeah, I, I feel like a nerd on Google Earth could could have probably done that. Right. I'd, I'd love to know yeah. how much they spent finding their seven thousand right. new islands. Oh, that's but, interesting. Yeah. So, did you decide not to buy the island? Decided not to buy the island. It was basically unfinanceable when you can't, <laughs> when you can't match up the corner posts with the survey. Yeah. Uh, it was a fun idea. That's tricky. Yeah. <laughs> uh what brought you to the US? Oh, uh college brought me here. Um my mom was born and raised in Oregon, mm -hmm. so I'd spend, you know, I think Easter every year cuz it was sort of spring break up and we'd come down and visit family, so it wasn't unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't my intention. It wasn't even my intention for college. Um I took a year off after after high school cuz I really didn't know what I was going to study. Yeah. You know, at that time I was pretty sure I had a family friend from when I was growing up that had, uh, went to Guam on a master's studies in agriculture mm -hmm. and ended up like writing policy and being invited back and hired with the, uh, ministry of lands or, or some, or agriculture department in, in, uh, or it was not Guam in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was super interesting. So of course, when I graduated high school, I was like, oh, I'm going to go study agriculture at that same school because that kind of travel opportunity sounded super interesting. Yeah. But, um, as it were, I, I'd spent a year after high school um, 
uh, went with my best friend and we actually went and lived for almost a year in West Africa doing relief work hmm. and, you know, just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I didn't figure out what I wanted to do. Yeah. I, I had a really impactful experience when I was there. Um, I was living on a ship that did, um, relief work and primarily medical relief work. Okay. So I got to sit in on a surgery, um, where actually they, they drew my blood, which I almost passed out for and, uh, and used it on, on a surgery, um, with someone that was getting a, uh, cleft palate, um, okay. cleft lip, uh, surgery, which was really cool. Yeah. But the anesthesiologist in that surgery was just this cool, cool old guy. I still remember his name, um, Charles Payne, and he was in his mid seventies and, uh, and you, you probably identify with this. He, uh, he was a linguistics professor his whole mm, life. And really? then when he was in his sixties, his wife passed away and he said, I'm just going to go do something different. Yeah. Went back to school and became an anesthesiologist and worked around the world doing medical relief work. Wow. And so I was visiting with him. I was 18 years old sitting in this surgery and, and it's such a cool, like, you know, you're in this quiet surgery thing where there's like life changing thing happening and just visiting. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I remember him asking me what I was planning to do and I was confused at that time. I don't know what I want to study, but I do know I want to go to college. And he said, don't worry about it. He says, people by and large change what they do multiple times through their life. Whatever you decide to do is going to be right because you're going to find something else that you want to do later. And just, I, it was super impactful to me just seeing this guy that had been yeah. through these iterations just calmly telling me, don't worry about it. So very, worry about very it. rare for that generation yeah. Yeah. to have right. that mindset. Yeah. I think that my generation is probably the first to really, to really accept that, uh, that kids shouldn't be asked to know what they want to be when they grow up. Right. Like you can ask a little kid that out of sport. Yeah. Like, Oh, you want to be a firefighter or an yeah. astronaut or president or whatever. Right. But, like when you're talking to high school kids, I don't know anyone my age that has an expectation that they should know what they want to do Yeah. because we had that expectation put on us and we didn't know. And yep. we tried to answer the question and it turned out every answer that we came up with for the most part was wrong. So it, it's, it's really, a, it's really unfair, you know, just given the times that we live in for, uh, for an 18 year old to know yeah what they should be studying right now to do whatever it is that they're going to do forever. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. then I came back from there and still didn't know what I wanted to do and, uh, and did what every Canadian or not every, but a lot of Canadian kids do out of high school, which is a kind of a rite of passage. And, uh, I went tree planting in yeah. the summer and, uh, which was a, a, another life changing experience. Tough job. <laughs> Super tough job. But like, <laughs> One of the greatest memories of my life, you know, I, really? I, I, yeah, I went, I went out and you know, worked in camp where we were camped out in, you know, remote areas, tree planting where they'd been logging and which, which was the area I'd grown up in. Right. And so it was right in my wheelhouse, mm -hmm. but the companies that did the tree planting, I, I ended up on a crew that was a bunch of local kids from where I grew up, you know, that grew up kind of like me, conservative logging community. And, uh, and we were out there and camped with like 60 people in like four or five different groups that would go out and plant every day. And all the other people in that camp were like from Eastern Canada, uh, university students that like, it, this was a completely life-changing different thing for them. Like, like mm. city kids, you know, one of, one of the guys that I became good friends with there was like, uh, you know, studying studying literature and yeah. he was out there grew up in a city never done anything like this before and just loved the hard work so now, now all of a sudden you're in a place where you're doing something really difficult with a complete melting pot of people and you're all having the same experience right you all have blisters at the end of the day you're all dog tired you know hungry as can be at the end of the day and uh sitting around a campfire just dog tired you know now all of a sudden here a I am with a bunch of local kids and we want to fire up the chainsaw and cut up some firewood and everyone else we're with, there's like, you know, playing guitar and singing <laughs> and, and just having this really awesome opportunity to get right to the, you know, right back to the basics. Like yeah. we're out here working hard, surviving, having fun. And it was just a 
super great experience. Again, just leading to opening opening up my eyes to other people, people that completely. I don't even think we really talked about what we believed. We just right. like we probably believed differently or like had different life experiences. But all that melts away when you're like just fighting the same fight. And it was so fun to break down those barriers. And not even that the, I don't think there was barriers, but just for me looking back on it retrospectively that it was an eye opener for me to just see that I have so much in common with people that I would never have thought I had things in common with. And yeah. it was really, and I think it's same for everyone else that I, that I was there with. So it was a rite of passage type thing. So yeah. as tree planting is where I all of a sudden saw the opportunity that led me to Oregon, which was I got into, you know, doing this hard work. And then I'm all of a sudden seeing the equipment out there doing the easy work, preparing for the tree planting. I'm like, well, I grew up running equipment. I'm actually pretty good at it. Yeah. Maybe I should do that. That's a little easier. So I ended up had a family friend help me uh, buy an excavator, and I went to work doing site preparation work for tree planting. Okay, and uh, that was when I spent the rest of that summer piling where the mountain pine beetle was again. Back to circling back to you know eight years earlier, however many it was. Mountain pine beetle is in full effect now in British Columbia, and and so I was doing this work piling up hundreds of truckloads of logs on landings to be burned mm. because the mills were saying, oh, th- these trees have died because of the pine beetle. They're, it's not going to be any good. We can't use it. Right, because it starts out as, as blue pine yeah, and then turns into just checked, yep. useless stuff. And, right? and Well, that's the thing, right? I just didn't know enough then. Yeah. And and in British Columbia, you have a different thing where the, the land is public land. Mm-hmm. And so the mill companies have quotas on that land. Okay. And of course, they're going to want the best timber, right? Right. And so the battle was the mills were trying to say, and they I don't think they'd done enough research to know if that timber would be good or not, mm. but they just wanted to, you know, they didn't want to mess with it. And so right. they were saying, no, this is no good. We shouldn't, this shouldn't be part of our quota. We shouldn't be charged for this. And so that's why they were piling it and burning it. I see. And, uh, and also here I am 19 year old idealistic. I'm like, this is wrong. Yeah. This doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like what's going on here? Right. So I, I, uh, sitting around logging camp then or whatever, whatever camp I was in one evening that, that fall with a guy that had studied forestry at Oregon state. And, uh, we were talking about it and I was just like, man, this is, this is wrong. Like we gotta be making, like, why we gotta be using this for something. And so he said he had a roommate in college that studied forest products at Oregon state. And that, that's what they did is, you know, try and find better uses for wood. And so next break I had, I hopped in my truck and drove down to Oregon state and, and, uh, kind of the rest of the history. I like met with a professor and I'm like, oh, this is what I want to study. And so I, I moved to Oregon to go to Oregon state and study wood science and engineering and and uh, learn how to better utilize wood. And at which stage did you invent cross-laminated timber? <laughs> you like that story, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't claim that I invented it, but yes. Uh, my dad, actually, I was doing my senior project, and I was home for for, for uh, the summer before my senior year and trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my senior research project. And, and my dad's actually the one that recommended it to me. And, and so what is it? What I, what I did at that time was so cross laminated timber is, is that you take, take wood and laminate it together and, and cross it like plywood is right. Mm-hmm. And so that you have strength in all directions. Yep. And so, um, so our idea was we could take low value timber like pine beetle, mm-hmm. um, that was, you know, part of the reason that it was getting downgraded and they didn't want to use it is because it doesn't have the right strength characteristics anymore. Yep. And so we thought, well, just like plywood, can't we laminate that together and make it stronger by doing so? And so I took some mountain pine beetle that, um, destructively tested then to be a lot worse characteristics than say a number one Douglas fir. And so Mm -hmm. my test was to say, I, I picked scaffolding planks as a, you know, as a, as a strong use of wood, that would be a good thing to test. So we took, you know, they take number one Douglas fir for um, two by 12 scaffolding planks. And so we took, and, and, I, and I had a friend mill up some half inch plies, so half inch by 12 inch planks. Mm-hmm. And then we cross laminated them together to make a one and a half by the 11 and a half, a nominal two by 12. Yeah. And destructively tested it, and sure enough, it got enough 
um, growth in its strength characteristics to be comparable with a number one Douglas fir of the same size. Comparable or better? Uh, I think it was, uh, my memory says it was, some were better, some were better, but scientific yeah. testing, yeah. comparable, I think. Yeah. Um, and so it was impactful and it was great. And uh, and it was really fun. Um, probably the less fun part of it is that I'm, uh, I, I could have used a little James Nash in me. I wasn't much of a writer and wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> Didn't care that much about academics. I was at the end of my college career, and I was just partying and having fun. Yeah, I didn't really want to be there anymore, and uh, <laughs> and so I did all the destructive testing, which was a blast. And now I had to write up my research. Yeah, and uh, I just remember I can still have visions of the papers I'd get back from my professor that were just completely marked up in red. Yeah, and I was just like, dude, what on earth? Just leave me alone. I just want to get out of here. <laughs> and uh, and so I literally went that you know. I, uh, my senior project, I had to present to our, to the, to the faculty and mm -hmm. everyone liked it, but, you know, I think I was frustrated afterwards because nobody ever, my professors, which are great guys, I still, still know them and stuff and they were just doing their job, but, but none of them were like, wow, this is a really interesting project. We should look into this further. They were just judging and grading my writing. And so I just like kind of left my samples behind and left and I was like, oh man, whatever. And then uh, about 10 years later, uh, uh, Oregon State was one of the leading research institutions that came out with uh, with cross-laminated timber, um, which is now a thing. And it's a really cool thing in revolutionizing the industry a little bit, the building industry. And so um, now... They're now, having to rewrite code because yeah. this stuff is doing better. Isn't it like outperforming steel and concrete? In and everything. Yeah. And, and particularly the thing that you would not think in fire. Yeah. So in big buildings... And you think about it, you know, wood from the outside takes a long time to burn to mm -hmm. the middle, right? So if you are now cross, what they're doing is cross laminating timber and making big walls, especially like sheer walls and interior walls to, to have strength in buildings or floors yep. um, and, and laminating like a, a foot thick sometimes and in a, in, in a really big building. And that's going to take a long time to burn through from the outside through that one foot thickness, right? But yeah. steel and concrete, steel, when it gets hot like that, it's just going to melt and yeah. crumble. And so they're way outperforming steel and concrete in those things, but also in, in all kinds of life cycle analysis as well, right? And, and the thing that, that I'm still interested in and, and want to see is that as that industry is growing, there's a, you know, they're catching up, like you said, with code and architects are, catching up with with designing buildings and it's super neat um to date just because it's easier a lot of it has been produced at least a lot of it in in north america has been produced with like high grade lumber mm -hmm. um and so the costs are high but it's just easier and quicker to manufacture yeah. to me the entire reason i started looking at it is still the reason i think that it has the most hope for us as you know all of us as society probably is that it, it can utilize lower grade and lower value timber. Right. And so we don't have to use all the best timber to make something like that. You can take low value wood, um, small diameter wood, um, that we're removing right now for forest thinning, for mm -hmm. um, fire mitigation and so on. All kinds of forest health projects. You can take that lower value wood and utilize that and make a high value product and, and put it into permanent long lasting. So as far as carbon storage, now you're putting it into a hundred year old building. Right. And, and that's a, a really great way to store carbon and to utilize material that we already need to, to remove for forest restoration and for um, forest health. What do people not understand about the carbon cycle and logging? I don't know. I can't speak for people, but I think, um, I think one of the things uh, a a common misconception probably is not realizing that when you do the right kind of logging, um, the kind of stuff that we're doing in, in Northeast Oregon, for example, uh, especially on our federal forest lands, is, is removing um, small diameter timber to allow stands to open up, trees to grow and become healthier where they can start to a, you know, store more carbon but take on more carbon when when forests get choked out and start dying and not growing fast they're not really doing their job as the lungs of the planet right no they're you know as they're rotting they're releasing carbon right 
Um, or if they're burning, they're releasing carbon. Yeah. But if they're growing, they're sequestering it. Yeah. And then if you turn that into a product that, you know, becomes a building or yeah. something like that, then it's stored carbon. Right. And that's probably yeah. the biggest piece is the, is the permanent stored stuff is yeah. that, you know, unlike concrete or something where you're unearthing things and, and, and bringing up to utilize instead now you're taking and storing and sinking something and, and letting something come up, a renewable material come up in its place. That's then again, taking and storing more carbon and it, you know, yeah, yeah. there's a cycle there. Yeah. And a neat thing about cross laminated timber, as far as, you know, using it to become the bones of a building is you don't have to cover it up afterwards. Right. Like it's, it's a visually and aesthetically pleasing product. And one of the things that you pointed out that I've paid attention to is anytime people are in a cross laminated timber building, they touch it. Yeah. 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 It's really neat, isn't it? Yeah. They walk That's along cool. and they touch that wood everywhere yeah. that, that it's, you know, yeah. exposed. It's just a, an instinct. Yeah. That's funny. I, you, I read the same study or heard the same thing and it, that uh, they've studied in buildings, big buildings, especially in the city, mm -hmm. um, where it can be used and it just has that human interconnection part. Um, it also, you know, when they're using it for floors, um, because it has so much strength, they can go right out to the edge of a building. Yeah. And and you can actually have like windows go right to the corner of a building because it has enough strength that you don't need to have supports um, yeah. the way that you would in a concrete building or something where you have to have a, the building the corner has to be a an anchor point. Right. I was uh, quoted in the New York Times this morning uh, about you know Eastern Oregon some of the struggles that we've had and a lot of it is is around timber and forest utilization. You know when I was a little kid there was five mills here you know, rolling 24 hours a day. And by the time I graduated high school, there were none. And the first mill to start back up again was you. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty, pretty incredible thing. And you became a major employer and then, you know, continued to find ways to do what people didn't think was possible anymore or never saw value in. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm, our business is is a business really focused on on forest restoration, and uh, and so yes, we're a mill of types, but uh, a mill centered around you know the way I like to look at it is looking at what are the needs of the land and the community, and as you said, you know when I first visited this community, that was one of one of the issues that that the the, the community was trying to address was we've lost our mills. Um, we want these jobs back, um, which is, is important. But then also the, the federal lands after, you know, century of, of fire suppression and then, and then all of a sudden stopping, then the federal lands were in, in poor health. And, you know, we're in a community, it's 75% of our forest land is, is federal land. And, uh, it, and that health problem isn't going to go away without some help. Right. And the economics aren't great when you're just focused on forest restoration, right? Because you're not just chasing the big timber and the, and the high value timber that's easy to make something out of. Like um, you can easily put together a business plan to make great lumber out of number one Douglas for big trees. Right. Yep. Um, and so that was a, that was a challenge. It's like, okay, we want a mill back, but it can't be what it, what it was before it's got to yeah. be something different focused on something different and so that's what that's what essentially we did is look at well what what are the products that can be made of the timber that needs to be removed so starting less from well here's the easy business model or here's the the type of mill that we're used to we need to find the timber for that instead looking at it and say well what is the timber that's going to be coming out if we're actually looking at doing proper forest restoration what does that look like and what products can be made out of that? And that's where we started um, and have continued from that model is it's got to fit the um, the needs of the forest first. And then from a size perspective, it's got to fit the community as, as well, right? And so um, just sort of reverse engineering what kind of what kind of mill. Right. So what kind of mill are you? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It, we're not a mill. We actually don't make lumber. So we... We manufacture at our facility here in Wallow. We manufacture uh, 
uh, peel poles, so for agriculture. Um, and we, For like fencing? Yeah, yeah. We actually don't sell a lot of fencing. We're close enough to the Yakima Valley and mm-hmm. some other big ag areas that a lot of our material ends up going into um, into trellising, so orchard and vineyard and hops farming. Oh, yeah. That's, where, yep. that's cool. And, uh, and so that's been a, a, um, an important market for us. And then we manufacture bundled firewood, which, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we kind of laughed from day one because it's really not that sexy, but it's needed. Yeah. And it's something that can, um, that we can export a, um, an important um, product that's utilized throughout our region um, from this community. And it's the one product that can kind of utilize all of that wood, regardless right. of size or species or whatever. And, uh, and we use our waste from it, um, from, from our productions to, uh, to kiln dry our firewood. So we kill pests. So we're not, um, moving pests around the region with, uh, in firewood. And it, it burns if you get mad at it, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's easy to start a fire with. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful true. thing Yeah, because, you know, if we're being honest, I think that a lot of people who are buying, you know, bundled firewood mm-hmm. probably aren't going through a lot of firewood. No. And starting a fire is a skill that not everybody has anymore. Right. So if you have kiln dried wood, <laughs> it's it, it's a big step up towards yes. you being able to get it on fire. Yeah. So yeah. it doesn't have pass in kiln dried is important, too, because um, from an emission standpoint, right? Hmm. So obviously wet firewood is going to throw off more emissions. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's, that's an important, important piece to it. So, so again, not really, a something that we would have dreamed of as a kid, man, I'm going to own a business that makes bundled firewood. But when you look backwards from it and see what it allows, it provides a lot of jobs and opportunity, and it provides an outlet for a lot of that low value raw material. Um, and then we're looking every day, you know, for us, it's about innovation. We're always looking at new products. We're really yeah. excited about a couple things. Now we, uh, we actually, uh, have a, a kiln on the way. We, we, uh, ordered a, a, a biochar kiln from, okay. um, from Kharkiv, Ukraine, hmm. which is kind of cool to be putting money, uh, some money into, into Ukraine. Um, <laughs> we're all putting money know, into Ukraine exactly. right now, whether we want to or not. <laughs> One way or another. <laughs> they got uh, my tanks, bro. I, know, I think, I think. <laughs> I think I think my way is uh, is uh, I'll I'll think of my way as being more noble. Than you. <laughs> let's let's help them by creating an economy. I'll I'll buy a kiln from yeah. The, no, but uh, we're we're excited about making biochar, which is pretty, which is also a pretty cool product from some of our waste that uh, has some really great um, opportunities for regenerative agriculture mm-hmm. and uh, and so every every day looking at what's what's biochar. Oh man, biochar. So but besides sounding like it's made up. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Uh, essentially it's the leftovers in the bottom of your fire pit at the end of the day. So yeah. it's, uh, it's burning wood in the absence of, uh, or in, in a controlled oxygen environment so that you're not burning off all the carbon. And so you're keeping the carbon in the charcoal and then crushing it and screening it. So it's the right size. And, and what it is, is it gives you this carbon structure that you can put in the soil. And it's just an incredible, like one small piece of, of biochar, the way I understand it, at least in is has the surface area because of the carbon of like a football field mm. for holding nutrients and water and things like that. And so it's incredibly good for for the soil to be able to bind up nitrogen, hold nutrients, hold water. Um, they're using it a lot in um, even with with animals. So feeding animals um, biochar mixed in with their food and uh, and it's getting in the manure and binding up some of the uh, the nitrogen there and also helping with emissions. Um, so it has a ton of cool, really cool attributes. And again, one of those things that, you know, now you're taking, you can take the lowest of low value of, of raw material from the forest that's really helping restoration and turn it into something that can also, you know, not only is it helping the forest be healthier and be able to have better water filtration and everything in the forest by having a healthier forest, but now you're putting it into ag land and, and, and helping regenerate soil too. So it's a, you know, to me, it's just a super cool thing to be involved in. And it's nothing new. Uh, no. So if you want to go down the biochar rabbit hole, you really need to start with Amazon Dark Earth, mm-hmm. um, which we think of, you know, the Amazon is a rainforest of incredible abundance, but because they do get so, so much rain and 
and because of their latitude, the plants can draw all the nutrients out of that soil really quickly and do. So the soil is actually of relatively poor health for agriculture, for growing crops for humans. And, you know, scientists and anthropologists have found these areas with this Amazon dark earth where they essentially used biochar, fish bones, you know, a number of other things to create some of the more fertile soils in the world. But that char is an incredibly important component of that. And it also is an argument um, that maybe the Clovis first theory is not the correct the correct analysis of how people's populated North and South America because huh. this Amazon dark earth appears to be uh, older than than what people could have done uh, through coming across uh, Beringia, the Bering Land Bridge, you know, 14,000 years ago. So, yeah, bio, biochar is not a new idea, but the way it's being utilized now is really interesting. We have a biochar test plot uh, right over here. Right. And we're doing a little controlled study on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see where it goes. And it's just another fantastic utilization of wood. And, you know, with our forest, we have currently more mortality than we have growth. Right. Um, so if you think about that as if this forest is your bank account, if you have more dollars that are dying than you have new dollars that are showing up, how does that end up? Yeah. You end up with nothing. Yeah. And that's a trajectory that we're on. So if we don't if we don't log this thing a little bit to get it healthier so that it can grow and not just choke itself mm-hmm. to death, God, it's just so critically important. And then you've got the the fire component of it as well. And you've had to advocate all the way up to the Ninth Circuit Court to to thin out areas where people are living and they're scared to death of what might happen if those forests catch on fire, mm-hmm. which happened this year, right? right. Last yeah. year. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a it's a scary thing, right? Fire is. Um, and it can't be our only driver, you know, either, right? I mean, I think that all across the West now, fire has become such a scary thing that it is driving things, but we have to... It's like everything else. We were so good at overreacting to things, right? Mm. And so we can't overreact to that like we have a lot of other things. Again, have to just be pragmatic about it. But as far as fire suppression, being as, the overreaction, just in the sense of now, all of a sudden, people are driven by the fear of fire, mm. and it is it's real. And I'm yeah. glad that 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 fear is turning into having better discussions about about what we got to do for forest management, and uh, and so. I think it's on us to continue to to use smart smart ways to do forest restoration and to really look at the places where we can protect communities is is important protect our water uh, sources um, and and start there because it's kind of you know, we don't we don't have the opportunity to completely restore all the forests across the West in the right. amount of time that we need to and. Or, or not need to, the time that it would take, right? And so we're not going to stop wildfires, but we got to be smart about it. And we got we to gotta look at the most critical places and we got to look at how we need to fund those, how we need to build businesses to utilize the material coming off from forest restoration. Um, and when I say not overreacting is there isn't a way to, to restore all of our forests in 10 years, right? Um, mm-hmm. Without doing what, we've done historically, which is just try to throw big, huge solutions at, at, at problems and over, that's what I mean by overreacting is right. we still got to be methodical about this and be right sized about how we, how we do it. Um, but how did you go about trying to take a timber sale, like just to reduce the danger of fire for a local community, like that ended up all the way in the ninth circuit court before you could go in there and cut trees. Like, I think that's an amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the one you're, you're speaking about, um, here locally was, was something that actually was, was really collaborative, a collaborative thing where the forest, we, we ended up with a district ranger on the forest that moved here and was willing to do hard things Mm -hmm. and said, Oh, that's a really important corridor. So we're talking about the Lostine corridor here. 
that's a really important corridor to this community. And it's also a real safety hazard and, and a number of different things. And, um, and it was a hard thing to do to go and say, we're going to do something there because it was, it was a really important emotional place for a lot of people on, from every walk of life. Um, and so kudos to, to Chris Stein, our district ranger at that time to say, I'll, we'll take that on. And so planned a project that was controversial and hard. And, uh, I think a lot of people came together to say, you know, this needs to be done and we can do it in a way that hopefully, uh, gets the results that we want, which is to create a safer place. And it, you know, it's a, a corridor that's a wild and scenic river, but it's also a one way road into the most popular backpacking area that's full of people all summer and hadn't burned in over a hundred years. Such so, a shame about, uh, the mosquitoes in that area, <laughs> uh, with the malaria. Yeah. Like all those malaria cases, I mean, it just ruined it. So, I mean, nobody's going there anymore and I don't blame them, but yeah, just, uh, I don't know, word, word to the people. Like if you don't want malaria, then, uh, might want to stay out, but you don't have to deal with that while you're logging in there in no. the wintertime, fortunately. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No. So a lot of the resistance was, I think they just used some plants as like scapegoats, but there was people that didn't want you to log because of moon warts. That sounds made up. I, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that, uh, that I, there's, there is a, a place that I love hiking. I love going with my family and, uh, it was incredibly important to our community and we had an opportunity to to work on an area with local contractors that were that care deeply yeah. about the land and the place and we knew them well enough to know that the contractors that we had working in there were going to care about that place and really work hard to do an excellent job um of not disturbing the soil of following prescriptions and really trying to make that a healthier and better safer place yeah and and there's also people that really didn't want work done in there for moonwort or whatever other reasons. And, and some of the reasons were they just wanted to have a 10 year study and do a longer study on it. And it was urgent, you know, it was yeah. like, someone's going to die in a wildfire if we don't do something. And so some, and we had a fire roll into yeah. that drainage so, last year. Yeah. So jumped ahead. And I think the results are going to be really good. We're almost done that project the just as we expected our local contractors have done an amazing job it looks beautiful care about the place wildlife is already moving yep. back in there yeah yeah and, and so i think it's going to go down as a as an example of of what can happen when you work with local people that are multi-generation and care about a place and can say we can do good things here even if it's controversial we can log in this place and do a good job because we care about it too Yep. And, and I think sometimes having that trust is hard to have, but hopefully you have enough good outcomes that, that trust can be rebuilt where it's like, no, we all want the same thing. We yep. want a healthy forest and we want to not all, you know, have it all burn up. Yeah. If people don't want to study forest ecology, forestry, um, but they want to have a better understanding of it. Because it is something that ends up in the public eye a lot. Mm -hmm. And like, let's just say, hey, I, you know, I have nothing to do with this. I live in a city, but I would like to know more about about forest ecology. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a book that you can recommend or, or a video that you can suggest that they watch? Like, how does somebody become somewhat educated in this? I think I don't have a really good recommendation. Yeah. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have been able to, to, you've been in it your whole life. It, right. And, uh, and so that's part of the problem. Yeah, that, I think, I think, I think you're exactly right is, you know, and we've looked at opportunities and again, you know, wish you could do everything that you wanted all the time, but we've looked at what I'd love to see is if we could do some co-op projects where we were able to take some of these restoration projects and do some hand thinning and piling and get kids from other parts of the state and stuff to come and, and work together and kind of do some summer, some summer work where they got to a work alongside kids from Wallow County, 
um, or, or, you know, kids from Eastern Oregon and get that cross cultural or cross sector, uh, experience that I was talking about earlier when I was tree planting, when I was young, where you're like, Oh, here I am working, you know, working to the bone, trying to like stack up some wood and thin this forest with a bunch of kids that have lived a completely different life than me and get those experiences together. So the practical experience of doing that work and being in that forest and feeling the energy from that place, but then also have that experience with other kids. And so that's on my bucket list of like something I'd love to see where we could get kids at the right age to get involved in those kind of experiences, both to work together, but also to, to see a forest, be a part of restoring some health that they can bring their kids back to for, or bring their families or come back to visit for the rest of their lives and see the impact of, of doing the right work. Nice. Yeah. I like it. Uh, what's the name of your business? Where can people find out more about it? So Heartwood Biomass is our business, uh, website, heartwoodbiomass.com. And, uh, that's probably the easiest place. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We could do this for hours. Hours and hours. We'll do it again. (laughs) All right. All right. Appreciate you, buddy. About a decade ago, I launched my old aluminum drift boat onto a remote whitewater river and floated for a couple sunny spring days to meet some friends who were bear hunting downstream. While I made them dinner that evening, one of my buddies came over and showed me a SIG rangefinder. I'd heard of the company and I'd seen their gear while I was a marine, but this was the first time I'd seen one of their products built for hunters. The range popped up instantly, and it continued to range everything I put the reticle on as I scanned across the canyon. I'd never seen anything like it on the civilian market, and frankly, not on the military one either. Since that day, SIG has come out with a long list of high-quality and innovative products for hunters, as well as continuing the same for military, law enforcement, and responsible citizens. They have some great training facilities located around the country, too. Check out all that SIG has to offer on their website, sigsour.com. And this episode of the podcast is brought to you by SIG. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share the show with a friend. You can also rate the podcast and leave a review. Your support allows me to keep doing what I love, which is meeting incredible folks and sharing their stories with you. For more content and photos, follow the show on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast or me at Six Ranch Outfitters. This episode was produced by Emily Brannigan with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Art for the Six Ranch Podcast was created by John Chatelain and digitized by Celia Christofferson. Tune in every Monday for a brand new episode of the Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.